Hello Internet! Welcome to another chapter in my CNC adventure. This week, I want to share with you a pair of small projects I took on, one for a friend and one for a co-worker. They wanted to see if a consumer-level CNC machine could help them solve problems they had. One of these projects succeeded, and the other was a partial failure. But before I dive into the DIY mayhem, I want to address a couple of other things first. Right now, I only get to play around with my Shapeoko on the weekends, so I have a very long list of things I want to get to. As a CNC amateur, one of my highest priorities is to explore all of the software options available for generating G-code. I think this is one of the biggest hurdles for someone starting out in CNC, and it's unfortunate since the 3D printing community already has a bunch of well-established software solutions for generating machine code. These slicing programs, as they're called, like the popular and free MakerWare, let you import 3D models and basically start printing with just a few user inputs. In the CNC world, free solutions tend to be complicated, and easy solutions tend to cost money. Finding something you're comfortable with, in terms of learning curve and pricing, can be daunting. But since a lot of paid CAD CAM programs have free trials anyway, there's really no reason not to explore every option you can. I plan on trying out G-Code Tools, Heekscam, Freemill, CamBam, and MeshCam in the coming weeks. And of course, I'll be sharing my thoughts and experiences with them here. One piece of software that might shake up the CNC scene in the near future is Easel, a CAM solution that's currently in development by the guys over at Inventables. It aims to make CNC more approachable for new users, and will be a web-based app much like MakerCam. I'm signed up for the beta, and I'll try to share my results with you all when I get my hands on it. Another thing I want to touch on is 3D milling. So far, everything I've done has been 2.5D. That is, I start out with a flat design and stretch it into the third dimension. I could machine a cylinder with this technique, but not something like a cone which has a varying cross-section. Someone in a previous video asked about 3D milling, and while I was able to point them to an example done by another person, I wasn't satisfied with my own answer because I didn't have any first-hand experience to give. So on Sunday morning, I woke up and decided I'd mill my own 3D object to see what was involved. With only 10 hours to succeed, I grabbed an STL file off Thingiverse and plugged it into MeshCam. Thingiverse is great because it's a free and open repository of digital models. It's primarily geared towards 3D printing, but the models work just fine for milling as long as you recognize the geometric constraints of your machine. MeshCam is a paid G-code generation program with some fairly advanced features that make it a bargain compared to professional-grade software like SolidCam, but for the budding machinist, the price can still be difficult to justify. I'll explain more about how I milled this relief map of Oahu next week. The bottom line is that the Shape Elko can handle 3D milling in wood like a champ. It's not by any means fast, but the level of detail you can achieve with just a 1 8 inch ball end mill is excellent. Okay, back to this week's projects. One of my friends is trying to make an ornate computer enclosure that's nothing like most computer mods out there. He wants to build a PC with an almost antique character to it, which I think is pretty interesting. But there are a lot of irregular details on the enclosure that are nearly impossible to shape with inexperienced hands. So my friend asked if I'd be willing to take a crack at it with a Shape Oko. Of course I was going to say yes. The goal for this weekend was to mail out a pocket in which to embed a nautilus shell cross-section as well as a cutout for a temperature monitor. In order to create a toolpath for such a weird shape, we traced an outline of the shell and scanned it into a JPEG. We overlaid a spline curve on the image and turned that into a path. MakerCam was good enough for this job, and instead of a pocket operation like I've used in the past, I went with a profile operation. The cutting parameters were pretty similar to what I've used before. Cutting depth of 1 16th of an inch, feed rate of 10 inches per minute, with a straight flute end mill. We did one test run in some scrap pine before moving on to 3 quarters inch plywood. The end result was very good with the edges coming out cleanly and the center cutouts separating without any drama. Take note of everything that went right on this project because it's in stark contrast to what happened later. This job was for my coworker. He had a glass table where the top rests on top of U-shaped rubber spacers. He lost most of them over the years and was no longer able to buy replacement spacers from the original manufacturer. The average consumer at this point would probably MacGyver some sort of bumper to place between the tabletop and its base, but when you have access to a CNC, the idea of manufacturing something of the same form and function as the original becomes much more viable and interesting. After poking and prodding one of the few remaining spacers my coworker had left, I concluded that the material was polyurethane based on its slight give and translucent amber color. What I didn't know for certain was how hard it was. The hardness of most rubbers and plastics is quantified by its shore durometer, a measure of a material's resistance to indentation. Soft materials like chewing gum rate at about a 20A, car tire treads are about 75A, and skateboard wheels are between 75 to 100A. I guessed that the table spacers were about an 80A durometer, so I bought a half inch thick, 6x6 inch slab of material for McMaster to work on. Manufacturing resources generally agree that anything softer than 90A is difficult to machine normally. You have to use specialized bits and cutting methods. I was hoping that 80A would be close enough to get away with milling conventionally, but I was quite mistaken. 
Here's what went wrong. Firstly, because polyurethane isn't a very good conductor and rotary tools don't go very slow, the heat generated during milling stays very close to the exposed surfaces. This led to melted rubber clinging to the end mill until it reached critical mass and was flung off into every corner of the room. Secondly, because soft materials deform so easily, as my cutting depth approached a quarter of an inch, the top edge of the material was often pulled into the end mill and mangled. I tried freezing the polyurethane overnight to stabilize it, but that didn't help nearly as much as I needed it to. In the end, I was able to mill out a U-shaped profile with thickened arms by cutting to a depth of 0.25 inches on one side, flipping the polyurethane block over, and milling the same pattern again. I used two holes drilled an inch apart as a guide so I knew the correct starting point for the end mill on each side. By varying the pre-programmed end mill size, I could also add or remove more material from the spacer to compensate for the rebound of the polyurethane after cutting. In terms of finish, these spaces are definitely not too pretty to look at. I'm going to have to look at using an abrasive to smooth out the edges. In hindsight, I should have just started out at a 90A durometer. Even if I'd overshot the appropriate hardness of the original pieces, it still would have had enough give to safely support a glass tabletop. Lesson learned, if experienced machinists say it can't be done, don't do it. But on wood, I can say with certainty that the Shape Oko 2 is brilliant. Even without upgrades, by using the right cutting parameters, this machine will get the job done. That's it for today. Thanks for listening to me ramble on about these two small projects. Please drop any comments or suggestions down below, especially if you have any experience machining rubbers or plastics, or if you have suggestions for my workflow. I'll see you next week with a full video for my Hawaiian Island 3D milling test. And yes, this does mean I'm pushing back my pump action hex nut slingshot repairs for another week or two. 